And this good news of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. The fact is, his only true name, Yahweh, was obscured for centuries, while the incorrect substitute, Jehovah, was mistakenly put in its place. We find here that it was Paul's manner to worship on the seventh day, Sabbath. There is only one way to be just in Scripture, and it happens through obedience to the Father, and that means His commands and His laws. If there is any one truth that we must understand about the Messiah, it is His heritage. Yahweh saw something in you that He can use. And so he called you as a candidate for everlasting life. He told him that his son's name would be called Yahshua because he would save his people from their sins. When you understand that the New Testament is an extension of the Old Testament, I'd like to welcome you to another Discover the Truth and say that it's a blessing to be with you today. In today's program, we're going to review the life of Abraham. This man is one of the most well-known and important figures within our Father's Word. Matter of fact, the legacy of this man continues to impact believers today. As we'll find, he was called the friend of Yahweh, and with very few exceptions was faithful to his Father in Heaven. There is much we can learn from this man, including what it means to have complete faith in the one we worship. I'd like to begin, though, with his genealogy in Genesis chapter 11, verse 27. Genesis 11, it says there, Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begat Lot. And Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity, in Ur of the Chaldees. And Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, in the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. We find here the genealogy of Abraham, or as it says here, Abram. Now why do we find here the name Abram and not Abraham? Well, at this point, Abram had not received the name Abraham. As we'll find, this name was given later and for a very special purpose. What does the name Abram mean? Well, this name literally means exalted father. Now we also find here that Abraham had two brothers named Nahor and Haran. We also see here that Lot was born into Haran. Now why is this important? It's important because Lot would eventually leave Ur of the Chaldees with his uncle Abram. We also see here that Abram married Syria, his half-sister. The name Syria literally means my princess. What do we know about Ur of the Chaldees? Or according to the Wycliffe Bible Commentary. This was an ancient city of the early Sumerian kingdom. It was a capital of Sumer. In Abram's day, it was a thriving commercial city with unusually high cultural standards. The buildings of the temple area were most elaborate. Now listen to this, friends. It says, the inhabitants worshipped the moon god Sin. So from this description, we find that the city was both one of great importance for its cultural significance and also for its religion. It says here that this city embraced idolatry, though, through the worship of the moon deity or moon god Asen. According to Joshua chapter 24, verse 2, we find that Abraham's father, Terah, worshiped these mighty ones. For it says there in Joshua, Thus saith Yahweh Elohim of Israel, your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nacor, and they served other mighty ones. And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood, and led him throughout all the land of Canaan, and multiplied his seed, and gave him Isaac." So from this passage we find that Terah, Abraham's father, was guilty of idolatry. More than likely he worshipped the moon deity, Sin, and others. And I believe that this was the reason why Yahweh eventually called Abram out from this place. He knew that in order to restore true worship that Abram would need to physically uh, remove himself from this environment. 
We can read about this in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. It says there in Genesis 12, Now Yahweh had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, into a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will multiply thee, and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed, as Yahweh had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him, and Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. Where Abram here was told by Yahweh to leave his country and family, and go to a land that he would show him. Now again, he was told to leave partially because of the false worship that this city and his family had embraced. You see, Abram had to separate himself from this false worship. Friends, this is a lesson also for us. Like Abram, we too must separate ourselves from false worship, including sometimes from our own family or friends. As believers, we must always make a distinction between pure and false worship. I'll give you an example. It would not be honoring to our Father in Heaven for us to keep Halloween just because it's a tradition within our family. For those who may not know, Halloween is a loaded with pagan worship. It comes from the Celtic festival of Samhain, a time marked with decadence and immorality. So again, as believers, we must make a separation. We must show a difference. We must be not like the world. We must live according to our Father's word. Now, I'm sure leaving was not easy for Abraham. He had to leave everything he knew and journey to a place and people he knew nothing about. This is one reason why this man is called the father of the faithful. He showed great faith, even in those instances where he had to leave everything he knew. He was, again, leaving his family, his nation, and everything else he knew and going to a place that was completely foreign. The fact that this man had the faith to do that was amazing. And I believe a lesson for us. As believers, we must always put our Father in heaven first. His word must come before family or friends. Or friends, we're gonna take a short break. Stay with us. We'll be right back after this short message. Many Bible believers today have followed tradition handed down by previous generations. They believe and were taught that Sunday is the proper day of worship. That the Savior changed the day of worship from the Jewish Sabbath to Sunday. The adoption of Sunday as the Christian Sabbath has little to do with the Bible and everything to do with Constantine the Great over 300 years after the Messiah's death. Constantine was emperor of the Roman Empire from 306 to 337 CE. He was a sun worshiper who on his deathbed converted to Christianity. In 321 CE, while still a sun worshiper, Constantine established Sunday as the day of worship. He decreed, On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and people residing in cities rest, and let all workshops be closed. In this coin circulated by Constantine in 317 CE, we see the face of Constantine on one side, and on the other, the figure of Sol Invictus, the unconquered sun. The sun god was also known as Mithras, and his birth was on December 25th. This date was adopted as the birth of Christ and became the date for Christmas many centuries later. Clearly, Constantine was an avid worshiper of the sun god Sol Invictus. Amazingly, Martin Luther, the champion of the modern day Protestant movement, said, they allege that the Sabbath changed into Sunday, the Lord's Day, contrary to the Decalogue as it appears. Neither is there any example more boasted of than the changing of the Sabbath day. Great, say they, is the power and authority of the church since it dispensed with one of the Ten Commandments. Nowhere in the Bible do we see that Yahshua and his apostles changed the day of worship from Saturday to Sunday. In fact, the Messiah in his Sermon on the Mount has this end time prophecy. Pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day.
If you are concerned about the coming end times, then you need our free booklet, Is There a Coming Rapture? to give you insightful information on the pre-tribulation rapture belief, understand the history behind it, and the dangerous consequences this belief will have on many believers in the latter days. There is no time to waste. To receive your free booklet, call now. Dial 1-573-896-1000. That number again is 1-573-896-1000. Or write to Discover the Truth. P.O. Box 463, Holt Summit, Missouri, 65043. Read and request on our website, yrm.org. If the phone lines are busy, please try again in 10 to 15 minutes. We're welcome back. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 8, we find that Abram knew and worshipped Yahweh. Or it says there in Genesis chapter 12, and he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west, and Hai in the east. And there he built an altar unto Yahweh, and called upon the name of Yahweh. Why is this example important? It's important because it shows that Abram knew the personal name of the one he worshipped. Understand that Yahweh is more than a name. It reveals the character and attributes of our Father in heaven. Matter of fact, in Isaiah 52, verse 6, we read this. It says, Therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore they shall know in that day that I am he that doth speak. Behold, it is I. So again, we find here that the name of Yahweh is special. And as believers, we too should call upon this name as again our forefather Abraham did. Now, even though Abram was a man of faith and conviction, we find two instances where he may have fallen just a, just a bit short. One example of this is found in Genesis tw uh, chapter 12, verse 12. It says there, Genesis 12, Therefore it shall come to pass, when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. What do we find here? We see here that Abram encouraged his wife to deceive the Egyptians into believing that she was only Abram's sister. You see, Abram was afraid and concerned for his life. So what was the result of this deception? Or let's continue reading. Verse 14 says, And it shall come to pass... That when Abram was coming to Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman, that she was very fair. And the princess also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house, and he entreated Abram well for her sake. And he had a sheep and oxen and he donkeys and men servants and maid servants and she donkeys and camels. And Yahweh plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called unto Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why saidest thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her to me to wife. Now therefore, behold, thy wife, take her and go thy way. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. Now, there's been a lot of debate among Bible scholars over the years concerning this passage. One question that's often asked is, did Abraham lie? Well, the answer is technically no. Remember, Sarai was technically his half-sister. Now, did he deliberately deceive Pharaoh? <laughs> Absolutely. There's, there's no doubt about it. Why did he deceive Pharaoh? Again, as we find here, he was afraid for his life. Now, was this the ethical thing to do? Or well, the answer is simply this, no. This was not the ethical thing to do. This was a weakness and one of the few mistakes we find in this man's life. He allowed fear to weaken his faith in his Father in heaven. Or well, friends, as believers, this again is a lesson for us. In this one instance, I believe that we must do better than our forefather Abram. Someday we may find ourselves in a similar situation. If that day comes upon us, we must stand in boldness and faith. 
You know, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego against the fires of Babylon, we must stand in complete faith, knowing that our Father in heaven, He is in control, and He is able to provide deliverance. Or the other lesson we find here is this. Even though Abram was a righteous man, he still made mistakes, and he found forgiveness. Except for Yahshua, the Messiah, our Savior, Scripture says that we've all fallen short of Yahweh's glory. So through this example, we find that we can make mistakes and still find forgiveness for our shortcomings. Now, even though Abram had this obvious shortcoming, by and large, we know that this man had great faith. Matter of fact, Genesis 15, verse 1, we find there that Abram believed Yahweh, and it was accounted uh, for him to righteousness. Here's what it says. After these things, a word of Yahweh came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, My sovereign Yahweh, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless in the steward of my house? This is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given a no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine ear. And behold, the word of Yahweh came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine ear, but he that come shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine ear. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in Yahweh. And listen, friends, it says here that it was he counted it to him for righteousness. In this passage, we find Yahweh promising Abraham that he would have a son of his own and would be his heir or successor. So even though Sarah was barren and both he and Sarah were well advanced in age, we find here that Abraham believed in Yahweh. And in verse 6, as we find that it was counted to him for righteousness. We're going to talk more about this in a few moments, but we're going to take a short break. Stay tuned. If you are concerned about the coming end times, then you need our free booklet, Is There a Coming Rapture? to give you insightful information on the pre-tribulation rapture belief, understand the history behind it, and the dangerous consequences this belief will have on many believers in the latter days. There is no time to waste. To receive your free booklet, call now. Dial 1-573-896-1000. That number again is 1-573-896-1000. Or write to Discover the Truth, P.O. Box 463, Holt Summit, Missouri, 65043. Read and request on our website, yrm.org. If the phone lines are busy, please try again in 10 to 15 minutes. Welcome back. Well, as we saw, Abraham was deemed righteous through his faith or belief in his Father in heaven. Now, if you ask me, this sounds like something uh, we would find also in the New Testament. Or as a matter of fact, it is. 
We find Paul using this example to illustrate faith in Romans chapter 4, verse 18, where Paul says there, Who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And be not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not to the promise of Elohim through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to Elohim, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform, and therefore was imputed to him for righteousness. Think about what we find here. Paul is, again, using Abraham to illustrate what it means to have faith. We find here that Abraham was about 100 years old in Sarah 90, and that her womb was dead. No wonder why Paul says here, who against hope believed in hope. Abraham had no reason to hope, but nonetheless he believed and had faith in Yahweh. Matter of fact, in verse 21, Paul says that Abraham was fully persuaded. In the Greek, this means, friends, to be fully or completely convinced. Abraham had no doubt. He had no hesitation. He had no misgiving about Yahweh's deliverance upon his promise. As found in the Old Testament, it is found here, this faith was imputed or counted to him as righteousness. This is, again, a lesson for us, friends. Sometimes we view a situation as impossible, but as we see here, nothing is impossible with our Father above. Yahweh can cure all diseases. He can mend all relationships. He can overcome all trials. All we must do is have faith in Him. If it is His will to intercede and we have faith in Him, listen, listen, friends, no door can remain shut. Abraham, against insurmountable odds, believed Yahweh, and as a result, we know that he and Sarah had a son named Isaac. So again, with Yahweh, the impossible becomes possible. In James chapter 2, verse 23, we find because of Abraham's faith that he was blessed with a special relationship with his Father in heaven. It says there in James, And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed Yahweh, when it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of Yahweh. Now, because of Abraham's faith, we find here that he was called the friend of Yahweh. The word friend is from the Greek word philos. and means to be fond of. How many here would like to be called the friend or philos of Yahweh? If we desire this relationship, we have an example here in Abraham to follow. We must again be fully persuaded or completely convinced in the promises we find within His Word, meaning that when it comes to faith that we can't have doubt, we cannot have hesitation. If Yahweh speaks to us, we must listen and follow without question. Or friends, today is that day. Yahweh is calling you right now, and He hopes that you will listen and take heed to this call and follow Him. Now, besides faith, we find that this man also obeyed Yahweh's commandments. In Genesis chapter 26, verse 5, we find there that Abraham obeyed his Father in heaven. It says, Because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So beyond faith, we find here that Abraham obeyed his Father in heaven, including, again, his commandments, statutes, and laws. You see, friends, obedience to our Father's commandments did not begin uh, at Sinai, but was established in the beginning. This was a requirement from the beginning, from the time of Adam, and continues to be a requirement for those in the New Testament. Our Savior, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, said, Think not that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Friends, we find here that those of the Messiah, those of us now in the New Testament, we still have an obligation to obey uh, our Father's commandments. Contrary to popular belief, our Savior's sacrifice did not remove the need to obey. Even though salvation is a free gift, and friends, absolutely, salvation is a free gift through the blood of our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah. But we must still comply to the word of our Father in heaven, for Scripture says that those who love Him will also obey Him. Now, one of those qualifications that Abraham obeyed was circumcision. 
we find this command in Genesis chapter 17, verse 9, where it says there in Genesis 17, And Elohim said unto Abram, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you, and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. Well, friends, we find here in this passage that Abraham had to circumcise himself and all his descendants. Now, why is this important? And how does this relate to you and I? Or in Colossians, we find Paul making a comparison there, saying that now instead of circumcision of the flesh, we are circumcised through baptism into Yahshua's name. Well, this is why we must accept the lessons here from Abraham. Because we find as he had to be circumcised, we too must be circumcised simply through the baptism though today of Yahshua the Messiah. Well, I pray that this program has been a blessing to you. Again, this is our day. This is your calling, friends. I pray that you would stay tuned and for future episodes, may Yahweh bless you. We invite you to take advantage of today's free offer by calling 1-573-896-1000 or write to Discover the Truth, P.O. Box 463, Holt Summit, Missouri 65043. Visit our website at yrm.org. There you can read and request dozens of booklets, watch hundreds of sermons, or tune in live every Sabbath, all at no cost to you. Discover the Truth is funded by our faithful partners and supporters. To donate online, visit donate.yrm.org. Set your DVRs, tell your family and friends, and join us right here next week.